My name is Ron Klasky. I'm an octogenarian who lives on Hollywood Beach. I'm 85 years old, and my wife and I moved to Hollywood Beach, Florida, 33 years ago. We moved from Chicago, where I was a film editor at the top of my profession, editing television shows, docu documentaries, corporate films, uh, commercials, television commercials, and all kinds of films. And we came down to Florida to make movies. At the time we came down, Bob Graham was the, was the governor of Florida. And he was funding the arts of film and television, the arts, film, and television industries with tons of money. And the industry was very healthy. So we came down with all our with all our sophisticated equipment to make movies. Um, and we had relatives out here that helped us to, to find this wonderful spot. After we got here, Bob Graham's term was up within two years, and he ran for senator as a senator, and the governor that won was a Republican who said, Film and television industries are getting away with murder, and we're going to tax them now. From now on, they got to start paying taxes, and the whole industry ground to a halt. So my wife and I suddenly had no business, and we got a job working in the t-shirt industry, and we've been making t-shirts and have our own store on Hollywood Beach on the beautiful Broadway for 30 years, and that's where we're making this film from today. But I want to talk about my service in the Army. I was drafted in 1957 into the Army, and I wanted to be drafted for two years. I could have joined the Army or the Air Force, because I was making, I was, I was working as a production, um, as a system director on films for the Air Force, and the Major said, join the Air Force and you'll, you'll be uh, treated, you'll become a project officer on films, and you'll be treated royally, you'll have a good salary, and for four years you'll be, um, you'll have a wonderful life. And I said, I want to serve my country, but I only want to give two years because I don't want to be involved in another war. Korea was over, and I knew that there was another possibility of a war in Vietnam coming up. And the reason I knew that was my father was always reading about world news, and he was very concerned about Vietnam as a possible um, conflict that the United States was going to try and start a war there, which eventually came true. But I didn't know that completely in 1957 when I got drafted. And I expected that my service would be that after my basic training, two months of basic training, I would be going to Korea as a soldier or as a some kind of clerical job in Korea. That's what I expected. But I was surprised to find out that the major in charge of the Air Force project that I was working on put in a good um, word for me that I was qualified to be in the um, qualified to be in the motion picture industry. And so that uh, after basic training, I was fortunate enough to go to the Pictorial Center in New York, in Astoria, New York, at the old Paramount Studios, where I became a film editor. And uh, because I, besides being an assistant director, I'd also been assistant editor. And so they made, they needed editors, so they made me a, a film editor. And that gave me access to all of the films in the vaults, because they had a film processing laboratory and a complete library of captured German and Japanese films. Um, that, that both those countries, as they waged their despicable wars, 
filmed every aspect of what they could. And I was especially interested in the in the German concentration camps because they filmed every aspect of what became known as the Holocaust. And so the films and the vaults precisely record uh, what went on with the Holocaust, with the rounding up of Jewish, um, the Jewish people were in Star David, um, matches, humiliated them, abused them, sent them to the concentration camps, only to be cremated. And I was watching all those films and I was really horrified because the cameramen, they filmed, uh, they, they filmed the, the inside of the ovens and standing in front of the ovens were these security guards who were smiling for the camera with all the Jewish humanity and it cremated behind them. My relatives, I'm Jewish. I mean, I was sickening. I was horrified by the whole experience. And I hated those smiling guards. How could they smile for the camera in front of such a horrendous scene? Uh, well, the films in New York were about people, soldiers, telling about how wonderful their duty was and how they enjoyed relating to the people that they were assigned to. Okay. That, that's, that was in New York. When I went to Germany, am I being recorded? Yeah, you're being recorded. When I went, when I went to Germany, the films I was assigned to do were 10 minute films that were going to be shown between feature films that were shown in U.S. Army, uh, European the movie theaters all over Europe. And these 10 minute films were public relation films showing all of the, all of the wonderful things that were being done to improve German American relations to help rebuild war torn Germany and Europe. And it was part of the Marshall Plan to rehabilitate Germany and Europe and really to stop communism from spreading throughout uh, from Russia throughout Europe and so it was that was part of the reason and they so they 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 um, the Marshall Plan created NATO and part of our films was a spectacular Blue Angels performance an interview with General Patton and stories about things that were very positive especially with German American relations. But with after the films were edited, we had to bring all the film, the edited film and the edited sound to Munich to be finished. We had to do some recording in Munich and we had to make a sound mix of all the soundtracks and we had to do the final editing. And I was introduced to an editor who had been doing these films for years since since the end of the war. Um, and um, and so I went, I was brought to, I had to go to Munich to assist in the final edit and compilation so that we could come up with an answer print or a sound and picture print that would be that that was acceptable and my job was to not only help finish the film but to approve the film that came out of the lab so that they could then make as many copies as they needed to distribute all over the european theater uh cinemas in europe okay now what about the holocaust films what about all of that where did that go okay well then go on. Okay. Okay. Going back to New York, because I was a film editor, I had the right to uh, ask to view any kind of film. Did anybody view the Holocaust film other than you? No. 
Okay. Tell me so, about that. Uh, I used to go on my lunch hour. We got an hour lunch hour. And I used to go up to the projection rooms and ask to watch those films. I didn't do it every day, but I did it quite a bit. With I was in New York for a year, and I watched those films, and they sickened me, and they, um, I was horrified. But how Jewish people were um, were mishandled and murdered, and also there were other groups in Europe that were mis that were mishandled besides the Jewish people. But the point is that those films were meticulously, precisely recorded so that no one can ever deny that the Holocaust happened. We have Holocaust deniers still saying that the Holocaust didn't happen. Those films are in our archives. I'm not sure where they are now because it's so many years later. But they exist and they're precise records of what the Germans did to the Jewish people and to other groups that they found deplorable in Germany. They murdered so many people in a war that never should have happened. So uh, nobody will ever have access to those films, you think? I know. I, I don't know where they exist today, but when I was there, they were in the archives of the the Kauf, uh, of what is now called the Kaufman Astoria Studios in Astoria, New York. Uh, how did you tell me again, once again, how you felt when you saw those films? Well, the, the, what really sickened me was that the, the German photographers the film, were filming the ovens with the cremated remains behind them, behind, uh, with the open ovens of cremated remains of what I, what I consider to be Jewish humanity. My relatives, I'm Jewish, and it just sickened me and horrified me. And standing in front of those ovens were two security guards, uh, and they were smiling for the camera. How could they smile for the camera in front of a oven filled with bones and cremated remains of people? I mean, it was sickening, and I hated those smiling faces of those security guards standing in front of the ovens. I went to Munich every month, at the beginning of every month, with the edited work print film. And um, I, I went to Munich uh, every month to work at the, R, at the RE Studios, Arnold and Richter Studios, studios that were there before the, before the war started. They, they made the Aeroflex camera. They, made the, they were great innovators in motion picture photography and and motion picture laboratory work in Germany. And apparently they escaped damage by the bombing of Munich. Munich was heavily bombed. And so in August uh, of 1958, I was having lunch in the cafeteria at Arnold and Richter Studios, and a young man sat down next to me who said he had just gotten a job as a delivery boy at the studio. And so we became, we started talking because in Germany, they don't have lunch for one hour. They have lunch for two hours. They have a two hour lunch break starting at noon, noon to two o'clock. So Ralph and I got a chance to really talk to each other. And I told him how I got started in the film business and how I wanted to be an, a director but they made me a film editor because of my film editing experience. And Ralph said that his goal was to be a director someday and that he wanted to, he loved cinema and he wanted to learn how, how to do it, but he couldn't um, afford to go to school like I did. I went to night school and learned all this while working by, during the day at a film studio in Chicago. But, um, but Ralph said, that he, his family lived a few blocks from Ari, and so he applied for a job, and they hired him as starting as a delivery boy, and he hopes someday to work into film production and to someday be a director. And so we became good friends, and then he said that he loved jazz, 
And I said, I love jazz. And he said, there are nightclubs all over all over Munich that have um, um, that have wonderful jazz bands. He, he says, they're not as great as American bands, but they're pretty good. And I said, oh, I'd love to go with you. Will you show me around? And he said, yes. Yeah. So we started going to, to um, nightclubs where live bands were playing. And we became really good friends. That was in August. And before that, I was always wandering around Munich and looking at all the sites, but I was alone. I hardly knew anybody there. And so this was a great friendship that I made with this young man who was 19 at the time. And so um, then, but after I, I was there, like after I met him, I uh, approved the answer print and went back to Kaiserslautern to make the next installment. So uh, in September, I went back and to Munich for the same procedure, and I met Rolf again, and we went to other bars. He took me to other nightclubs, and we heard great jazz, and we talked more about our experiences, and uh, I talked a lot about my experiences in film. And, um, and he talked about his goals. He was very upset about the Berlin Wall that was separating families. He told me that during the war, his father, uh, his, his mother's brother and their family, uh, wife and children, were killed in an Allied bombing when a, a direct hit hit their apartment building. They were all in the, in the basement, uh, what they call the shelter bomb shelter, but the whole building collapsed on the shelter and everybody in it was killed and, and his mother's brother and her fa his family was killed. And also he said his father's sister was severely injured uh, by Allied bombings when, it, when a bomb partially hit their building. And so his sister, her husband and children were all badly injured. And so he talked about how he was grateful that the war was won by the United States because he said we were helpless victims. We couldn't end the war. It took the United States to end the war so that we could survive. He said that our building was never touched by an Allied bomb. We always, when the bombings, when the air raid sirens went, the sirens went off, we went into the shelters in the in the in the basement, and we never our building was never touched somehow, and uh, we survived the war, and that was very important to him, and and our 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 relationship strengthened. So after we enjoyed um, so many good times together, uh, what listening to to the music, to live music, and having a few beers. Um, Rob said to me, next month is Oktoberfest. He said, we're going to we're going to have a good time at Oktoberfest. He said, that's the greatest party you can ever have. At Oktoberfest, we're going to the Hofbrauhaus to have beers and enjoy all the festivities. I said, great. When I arrived in October, we started walking to where the Hofbrau house was. And I told him about an incident that I had had um, with a friend of mine who was an African-American soldier. He was a corporal. His name was Corporal Harrison. And he was, a, um, a, we turned out to be a good, good friends. We'd even eat breakfast together every now and then. And, um, but there was a problem with the barracks. I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm also, I love history. I love reading. And in the barracks, the American barracks, they turned the lights off at nine o'clock in the entire barracks. So the only lights on were in the bathroom. So one day I was in the bathroom reading when I heard an argument going on by the sinks. I was in the toilet in a, in a, in a covered toilet. And there was an argument going on by the sinks. I went out, and it was Corporal Harrison, my friend, who was being abused by a white soldier 
who they had an argument, a disagreement about something. And I don't know what exactly it was, but the two of them were shaving. And I went in there and broke up the argument and, um, and, and stopped them from what might have become a fight. And then the next day, I went to Munich in October. I mean, in, in, in September. When I got back from, from Munich in September, I saw Corporal Harrison, and he was stripped of his, of his rank. His rank was gone. I said, what happened to your other corporal? He said, the day after the argument, you went to Munich, and Conrad, the white soldier, he went to the captain. He brought me to the captain and said that, he, that I, I had threatened him with a razor blade. I said, you were just shaving. He said that he threatened him, threatened his life, and the captain listened to the accusation and stripped me of my corporal rank. And that's how they, they, they took care of that. And I said, I was your witness. I said, in America, you're innocent till you're proven guilty. But in the United States Army, and this is 1958, you're guilty until you're proved innocent. I said, and they would accuse you. They could convict you just by an accusation. So I said to, um, I said to Harrison, we're going to the captain. And I'm going to tell him what really happened. And that's what we did. We went. The captain listened. He was very receptive. He said that the whole incident was racist and that he was going to do everything in his power to restore Corporal Harrison's rank as soon as he could. So when we came out of the captain's office after the captain said he would help Harrison, Conrad, the white soldier, was waiting for us. And he said, how dare you defend that black man? And I said, white, brown, or yellow, we're all the same. We all have the right to live and be free. And even though we're all very different, uh, we're not very different at all. And he said, that's bullshit. He said, you're nothing but a goddamn bastard. And he, and, and uh, I said, I heard Martin Luther King speak in New York who talked about that black Americans are tired of being oppressed and put down. And he, he spoke in beautiful language. And he said that someday we're going we're gonna to lift the African-American community is going to flow like a mighty stream through democracy in America. And he said, I hate Dr. King. King will never win. And uh, stop, um, stop liking Dr. King. And I said, Conrad, stop hating black Americans. You've got to change your, your way. And he slugged me in the he slugged me in the in the jaw, and Harrison immediately attacked him. Harrison was a very strong man, and he would have beat the hell out of him. But the captain came out right at that point and stopped the whole thing. He called the captain, called the military police. The police came almost immediately and arrested Conrad. If if, if Harrison had beat up Conrad, he could have been court-martialed at that time in the army but we were saved. And so that's my story about what happened, and I told that to Rolf. And Rolf said, you sure are outspoken. You say what you believe. And, and uh, he admired it. And then we went to the Hofbrau house, and he, we had a good time. And then he said, you know, I've been telling my parents about what good friends we've become. They've invited you for dinner tomorrow. So the next day, we went to Ralph's home, and when I walked in, I took one look at his father, and it was the spitting image of one of the security guards in front of the oven. His same smiling face, same heavy stature, almost the same clothes that were, that were in that, that film that I hated, and I wanted to kill him. I, 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 but I couldn't. I, I mean, Ralph must have loved his father when Ralph when the war ended he was Ralph was seven years old how could he know what his father did during the war 
So I asked his father, what did you do? Um, what, what's your profession? And he said, I work at an auto mechanic store at, a, at an auto repair shop. I said, oh, you're an auto mechanic? He says, no, I write the orders and I collect the money. And so then we sat down to, um, to dinner. And I had been telling Rolf that there are incidents that happened in Kaiserslautern that every Saturday morning we had to attend church. I'm Jewish, but, um, but we had to attend the Catholic church and listen to a sermon by a priest. So I think Ralph assumed that I was Christian. So when we sat down to dinner, Ralph's mother said, so what is your religion? And I said, Jewish. And Ralph's father said, oh my God, I can't believe it. He said, we had no idea what happened to the Jewish people. And I said, how could you not have no idea Kristallnacht happened in Munich in 1938? They wrecked Jewish businesses. They pounded Jewish people. They killed thousands. They burned synagogues. And, and Hitler broadcast his hatred for Jews all through the war. How could you not know what was going on? He said, we... We didn't know what happened to the Jewish people until after the war ended. And to me, that was a convenient excuse for people who always who lose a war to say we had no idea what was going on while it was while it was happening, especially to the Jewish people. And now tell me what happened after that. Well, then I've got a big mouth. See, I'm always sounding off about a lot of things. And I said to his father, did you ever? I said, Dachau is right on the outskirts of Munich. It's a concentration camp and a crematorium facility for the Jews. I said, did you ever work at Dachau? And he said, nine. No, I never did. I always worked at the auto mechanic, at the auto repair shop. And as soon as I said, did you ever work at Dachau, I knew it was the wrong question to ask because it enraged my friend Rolf. He said, how dare you accuse my father of working at Dachau? Do you think my father had something to do with the murder of all those Jews? He called them Juden. And I said, no, he, your father said no. And um, I accept his answer. And Rolf said, what's the basis for your question? How can you come up with a ugly question like that? And I said, I'm sorry I said it, it was a mistake. Um, I, I just know that, that your father had to know what was going on during the war in terms of how the Jewish people were, were treated and handled and murdered. And I said, you know what, I'm feeling sick and I'm going, I'm, I'm gonna say thank you for dinner and I left the apartment. And Rob said, we can never be friends again. And so that's my story. Our friendship ended, and um, in November, I stayed away from the studio and from Rolf, and in December, when I went to Munich, um, I saw Rolf, we sat across an empty courtyard, looking at each other, and it said, I, I thought about the incident, and with Rolf, and he, he sat at one end of the courtyard, and I sat at the other, and I thought, you know, President Lincoln said at the end of the murderous civil war with malice towards none. And I thought if only Rolf's father would have said I was forced to work at Dachau, I had to do it. I had to follow the order in order to protect my family. I could have forgiven him and I might have forgiven him. But my question is, why the hell was he smiling when the cameraman took that picture? That's what really got me. Anyway, that's my story. And then it turned out that I was sent home um, to, um, I was Jewish, but I was on a list to get the boys home for Christmas, um, in time for Christmas. And so on the flight home, I was seated next to a Marine. He said he was a lifelong Marine. And I asked him, what is that badge that says Semper Fi? And the Marine said, Semper Fi is do or die. He says, that's my motto. That's what I believe in. 
And uh, he said there's also another badge that says Semper Fidelis. It talks about courage, loyalty, never leave a, a Marine behind, and always look out for your for your uh, for your fellow soldiers. And I told him I was proud to meet him. And then the Marines said, Do you know that there might be a war in Vietnam, coming up in Vietnam? And my father had been writing to me about Vietnam. My father was um, a world news junkie. He loved to read world news. And he was sending me articles about what was going on in Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh had, had uh, won independence for Vietnam after the Second World War ended. Because France had, had controlled the country for a hundred years, but they had to abandon it. Um, they had to abandon it after Germany invaded France. All right. So then, what happened after uh, uh, France abandoned Vietnam? So, when when Germany invaded France, France uh, um, vacated Vietnam, but Japan immediately invaded. Vietnam and controlled it until they surrendered at the end of uh, the Second World War and Ho Chi Minh declared independence to Vietnam uh, for Vietnam before um, he built hospitals, banks and community centers and he built up the country and and uh, he, he he had independence for Vietnam, but then France decided to invade again. And it turned out that President Eisenhower was giving them a billion dollars a year for France to take over Vietnam again. And so, okay, so I said, he says, so the French took over, um, well, the Marines said that, um, that, that Vietnam is going to turn communism. We can't let that happen. And I said, what do you have against communism? I said, you're living under a socialistic society. The entire military is patterned after communism. They house you, clothe you, feed you, and your pay is all. Everything is provided, including health care. You're under that lifestyle right now. Do you like it? He says, it's good for me, but not for my family. My parents own a successful business in Miami. They live in a big house. They have a wonderful lifestyle. That's capitalism. I said, why would you want to stop a country 10,000 miles from Miami from having the kind of government they want? Organize it under one local government to guarantee the country's resources benefit Vietnam, not some other country. And so he said, how do you know so much about Vietnam? I say, my dad has been, my dad has been writing me about Vietnam. He worries the United States might start another war. And the Marines said, I'm ready to fight those slope-headed groups to keep my parents successful. And I said, you believe the poor ride, bicycle riding, rice farming Vietnamese peasants are less than human? Yes, he said, they are goddamn sly-tied dinks. I said, that's what Hitler said. He dehumanized the Jews, killed most of them. How dare you compare me with Hitler, he said. Watch your mouth. I said, I'm Jewish. Here are my marks bring back bad memories. And he said, if those cooks try to make Vietnam completely communist and my country says we can't let them, I'm going over the, there to fight. And I said, all they want is freedom and independence. And the Marines said, tough luck. I said, how do you know what they look like? He says, we've been watching information films on the Viet Cong. So I said, they are preparing you for a possible war? And he said, if President Eisenhower says go, I'm on my way. And I said, you grew up in segregated Miami. African Americans were dehumanized. My family visited Miami Beach. We couldn't believe the racist signs everywhere, signs and drinking fountains and washrooms separating colored from whites. And those signs were legal. Separate beaches for blacks and whites. When a black teenager accidentally wandered onto a white beach, they beat him to death. Yeah, as he said, teach him to stay on his own beast, the Marines said. And there are, are there any African Americans in the Marines, I asked. Yes, he said. If we go into battle, then they're my brothers. Marines will 
protect each other no matter what the, their color. And I said, you will have to fight with the Viet Cong in their jungles. I was angry. Will they defoliate their rice crops if the battle gets rough? Bomb the vents of villages filled with women, children, and babies? And the Marines said, if Vietnam is lost, communism will spread throughout the world. And I said, while countries fight countries, armies fight armies, they really are brothers, even if they are from different races or different countries. Soldiers are related to each other through the universal bond of humanity. Trouble is, countries will always find a reason or an incident to persuade their country into fighting another war. And the Marines said, stopping communism is a damn good reason. And I said, on the authority of presidents and military leaders, the power of a nation is not money or weaponry, but men ready to obey, ready to go into battle, ready to prove themselves worthy of their country's citizenship, ready to behave heroically, ready to sack their lives or on command, sacrifice their lives on command, I said, the words tumbling out of my big, fat mouth. Through courage and contempt of death, man feels his, his, his humanity. If the soldier dies, if the soldier dies, will the soldier's nation care more than a few moments? There are so, so many more ready to be sacrificed, and military leaders are more than willing to send them into conflict. Stop it, the Marine yelled. You're going to have a nervous breakdown. Stop it. Semper Fi, do or die. I said, that's your motto. It will never be mine. I hate war. I've heard enough from you, the Marine says. Don't talk to me during the rest of the flight. And during the rest of the flight, I thought about Ho Chi Minh and a statement he made that has become my motto. And he said, all the peoples of Earth are equal from birth, have a right to live, to be happy and free. And another part of the story is the Vietnamese beat the French at the MBM Pew in 1954. They beat them and kicked them out of the country and took over and they were independent again. And this was three years before President Kennedy actually sent in advisors while President, while Vice President uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson wanted to send in hundreds of thousands of troops to Vietnam. And so, um, my, my motto is what, um, what Ho Chi Minh said, all the peoples of Earth are equal from birth, have a right to live, to be happy and free. That's my motto. I wish everyone on earth would make it their model.